Welcome. This is Adult Bible Study from First Baptist Church Rosenberg. Today's lesson, we're still in Daniel, and the title of the lesson is Humility Required. And the verses are Book of Daniel, chapter 4, verses 28 through 37. King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of the empire of Babylon, a huge empire, a rich, prosperous empire, an empire that had conquered many other nations in the area. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of this huge empire. He was probably the most powerful king on earth at that particular time. <clears throat> now, King Nebuchadnezzar had a, um, a dream. And in this dream, he saw a huge tree, a magnificent tree, a tree like no others. It grew up to the sky and it provided blessings for all the creatures below. It was an incredible tree. And then, out of nowhere, a voice came and demanded that the tree be cut down. Next thing Nebuchadnezzar knows in his dream, the tree has been cut down. Nothing lasts, or nothing is left, except for the stump. And the stump is bound with iron and brass. Nebuchadnezzar found this dream to be somewhat disturbing. And he called for Daniel, his advisor, to come and interpret the dream for him. Tell him, what does this dream mean? So Daniel came. Nebuchadnezzar told him the dream in detail. And Daniel said this, King, that dream means that at some point your kingdom is going to come to an end and you will be driven out and humiliated. Yet, there will be an opportunity for you, King Nebuchadnezzar, to have your kingdom restored, if only you recognize that God is the only, the one and only true God and the most powerful of all, even more powerful than you. So that was the story of the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. So we take up now in our scripture for today. And this is some time after he had the dream. So let's look at verse, starting with uh, verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. What they're saying in there is they're talking about the dream and the interpretation of the dream. This has happened. 12 months later, so a year after the dream, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Now, if you look at this and think about it, walking on the roof, this wasn't simple, uh, the same kind of roof that we have on our houses now. This was a, a uh, castle, a palace, and the roof was flat and there were walkways on this roof, probably patios and gardens on this roof. It was huge. So he was up there taking the royal stroll, so to speak. And he said, he either said it to himself or to the attendants that there were there with him. But he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence? by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? 
Well, he's kind of partially right because he did build the royal residence. In fact, he built a lot of stuff in Babylon and he was a big part of Babylon becoming such a great empire. But look at the end of what he's saying there, how he concludes this. I built it by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Hmm. Me, 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 me. I did this all by myself and I did this all for myself. He does not recognize anybody else's help and he does not recognize that all things come from God. A very self-serving, self-centered statement. And he's up there on the roof where he can see a large part of his primary empire, the city beneath him. And he's so proud and so full of himself. Hmm. Is that the way we should be? Well, maybe not. Let's see where it goes from here. Moving on, starting with verse 31. Even as the words were on his lips, that means the, these words that we just read had just barely escaped his mouth. So the word immediately, almost before immediately, comes to mind. So even as the words were on his lip, a voice, a voice from where? A voice from heaven. And what did this voice from heaven say? This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. That's certainly uh, not a very good start. And it goes on. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. That doesn't sound real good for Nebuchadnezzar. So let's start back and look at what God is saying here, your royal authority has been taken from you. Remember me saying King Nebuchadnezzar was probably the most powerful king on earth at that time. There was nobody to challenge him on earth. So who challenges him? God. And who beats him? God. God has authority over this man who nobody else has authority over. Think about that for a minute. Think about where that puts Nebuchadnezzar, this great king, in relation to God. Nebuchadnezzar felt very proud of himself. He felt that I am the greatest. And in many ways, he was the greatest, the greatest on earth, but he was not the greatest. And he refused to recognize the greatness and authority of God. So he was a pretty good king, except for that, in his mind, insignificant little thing. Well, it wasn't insignificant at all because God took away his kingdom. And he says, you'll be driven away from people and we'll live with the wild animals and eat grass. So what a turn of events. He's going to be driven away by his people, the people who recognize his authority, recognize his reign, recognize his position. Why are they going to drive him away? Well, let's think about that a little bit here. It says he's going to live like the wild animals and eat grass. And he does. There is, uh, 
there's a mental illness called zoanthropy in which people consider themselves to be animals. So my feeling is that probably Nebuchadnezzar uh, had this mental illness and of course God caused that to happen but he had this mental illness where he thought of himself as an animal. Now back in those days there is almost no real understanding of mental illness and if somebody was crazy, did crazy things, and like this case, thought they were an animal, um, most of the time they thought the other people would think, well, they're, they're inhabited by demons. And they didn't see that there was any cure for this. And so they would drive them out, drive them out of the city. I don't want you around me. Go away, get away and they wouldn't let them in. They'd be very harsh about it. In fact, very forceful in driving them out. So this is probably what happened, that he became mentally ill. He believed he was an animal. People thought he was crazy, which he was. And they forcibly drove him out of the palace. They drove him out of the city. They drove him out of their sight. And so it says, seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign. Seven times. Now, the Bible scholars don't really know for sure what seven times is, but the most common interpretation of this is seven years. So, Let's go with that. So he's driven out and he lives like an animal for seven years. And in the seven years, after it's over, it says, then he will recognize God as the most high sovereign over all kingdoms. So wow, Nebuchadnezzar is out living like an animal. So let's see what happens next. Verse 33, immediately what has been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. So he immediately went crazy, if you will. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Picture this in your mind. He was living like an animal. He basically, he had become a wild man. No sense of, of humanity in him. And it says he ate grass like an ox. He lived off the grass, the weeds, the berries, whatever he could chew on and whatever would sustain him. He didn't till the soil or anything like that. He lived off the land, so to speak, for seven years. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven. One interpretation of that is he slept outside. He slept on the ground. He didn't have a shelter at all. He lived like the animals. And his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle. Interpretation of that is probably his hair grew long and was all matted up. And his nails like the claws of a bird. He probably his nails grew without any trimming or they grew longer. They would only break off and they were sharp like claws. That again just exemplifies the wild man nature. Of, of Nebuchadnezzar. That's a horrible way to, to exist. And I can't help but think that because God was trying to make a point with him, that somewhere in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he, uh, he had some awareness of what was happening to him. 
Uh, he realized that this wasn't right. He probably realized what he lost, but at the same time, he had no control. And that's often the case with people who are severely mentally ill. So Nebuchadnezzar was in a bad, bad way. So after this has gone on for seven years, what happens? Starting with verse 34. At the end of that time, and here Nebuchadnezzar speaks, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? So big turnaround for Nebuchadnezzar. Simple way of putting it, he learned his lesson and he regains his sanity. And then he praises God and he recognized the fact that God is the most high. He says he, he's going to live forever. His dominion is eternal. He endures from generation to generation. And he can do whatever he wants to. And then at the very end, it says, no one can hold back his hand, which means he's stronger than anybody. He has more authority than anybody. And finally, no one can say to him, what have you done? In other words, no one has the right to question God. Big, big change of attitude. As I said, Nebuchadnezzar really learned his lesson. But think about it. Here he, he was for seven years living like an animal. And I believe he partially understood the uh, depravity of his situation. And then God blessed him and allowed him to return to sanity. And once that happened, Nebuchadnezzar never doubted God. He said, okay, if you can do this to me, who I am, you can do this to anybody I recognize you, God, as the absolute, the most high, the most mighty, the one single authority over everything. Verses 36 and 37. At the same time, Nebuchadnezzar is still talking here. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were, were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. All right, this is got to really be looked at as something that is most unlikely to happen. Here's a person who went crazy, was driven out of his kingdom, who was away for seven years, and all of a sudden, everybody's just going to open their arms to him and take him back? This is not normal. Now, most of the people would still, even if he did appear to be sane again and was referred, saying, oh my goodness, I, I feel so much better, I must feel sane, and I believe that God is the greatest and did everything right. People are still not going to trust him. But they did. They honored him. They sought his advice. They put him back on his throne. This could only happen with God's intervention. This is not normal human behavior. This could only happen because God made it happen. Once again, an example of the authority and the power 
that God has over Nebuchadnezzar's life. Going on in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar is saying exactly the opposite of what he was saying at the beginning of these scriptures. Before, he really didn't recognize God as any kind of power, anything over him. He thought he, Nebuchadnezzar, was the greatest. And now, this, this bears reading again. Think about these verses or this verse as we read it again. This is something that we all should say. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You could almost take that verse and just insert your name. Now I, your name here, Praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right. All his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So everything he does is right. Everything he does is just and he can take your pride and humble you. So... This is kind of a, a lesson about pride. It's okay to be proud of your accomplishments. It's okay to say, I've done a good job, or to be pleased with the outcome of some efforts you make. If you're a craftsman, to look at what you've done and take some pride in the craftsmanship of your art. But it is not okay to put yourself above God. If you do a really good job, you need to remember what part God played in you doing that really good job. Sometimes I think about the blessings that I have. Uh, you know, wonderful family and, you know, in some ways I'm comfortable uh, I've got great friends at church. Uh, these are all blessings, but I can't take credit for that. I cannot. I've done my best, but I've done my best because God has been there strengthening me and guiding me. And we all need to understand that, that God is our strength and God is our guide. We don't do it on our own. We have nothing really to say, I'm so proud because I did it myself. That's just not right. So remember the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar here. Remember to always glorify God for his part in the blessings in your life. Thank you. Mm -hmm.